All right, this morning we're going to do something a little odd. Normally I take a passage and do an expositional message on it, but we're going to be looking at a concept, a concept that I think is so important and it's one that you and I, and I'm struggling with it myself, but one that we, you and I need to implement in our lives. I'd like for us to turn to Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. And we're going to look at one word. And we're going to look at what it is. I'm going to give you the textbook definition. Then I'm going to give you my homespun one. And then we will go look at, about the New Testament looking to see uh, where it is. Uh, where it is mentioned and how that is applicable applicable, and how we utilize it in our own lives. All right, let's take a moment and uh, go to the Lord and pray. Lord, if you are not here and if you do not speak, then if we are, anything that is done from this pulpit is of little use. And Lord, we pray that the Spirit of God would, would work in every heart. I pray, Lord, that every one of us might be receptive, that we would seek to be doers of thy word, and not simply hearers. And we thank you, Lord, for the, the word of God that we have in our English language and that we have had it that's been there for so many centuries and how we benefit so greatly from it. And I pray, Lord, that the, this morning that we would leave with something, whether it be uh, from the message, from the uh, from my Brother Hartman's uh, lecture, from uh, the fellowship. Lord, there's so many ways to receive a blessing, and may we go... Uh, forth and beat your servants in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. There's a little joke in which the person says, what do you call someone who speaks five languages? And the answer is that that person is multilingual. And then the next question is, what do you call someone that speaks two languages? And the answer is bilingual. And then the third question is, what do you call someone who speaks one language? And the answer is Ameri an American. And uh, so how many of you speak more than one language? Raise your hand. All right. That's really great. Okay. Now, all of you that speak more than one language, if you speak English fluently, you know that there are some words that just have no word in the English language. In other words, there is no uh, synonym. It doesn't cross uh, the lingual barrier. And that's what we're going to look at here this morning, a word that does not have an English translation as, as being one word. Now, we, we're going to talk about the concept, and I hope that when we finish, you'll understand what it is, but we don't have a word for it. Now, there is a word in the Bible that is used to translate it, but it really, in reality, it does not do so. Uh, now, by the way, folks, and uh, if for you English speaking people, let it be known that there are words that we use that, no, that won't, don't translate in other languages either. And, and you know, it's so funny when I took Greek in college, uh, New Testament Greek, Koine Greek, the, the Greek that the New Testament is written in, uh, there were people that got smacked right up the head uh, for the first time in their lives with a different language and they were just mystified by the fact that well you can't translate that well yeah but that it goes the other way too okay so but we're that's what we're going to look at this morning and we're going to read a couple of verses very very familiar uh here in in galatians chapter five paul has talked he's written about the the the, the works of the flesh and it's it's a very it's a pretty sorry list folks and, and that's what our natural, our, the natural me, the natural you, will produce left to itself. Now, that doesn't mean that we do every one of these. It's like, like the concept of total depravity. Total depravity doesn't mean that you're as awful as you could possibly be, but it does mean that that depravity, that depravity that came on man the instant he fell, permeates all of our being, all of the, our personality. In other words, all of us is corrupt. Paul said, for I know that me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. So, and then he, he, course, he, he, try, uh, he compares the works of the flesh with the fruit of the spirit. Verse 22 says, but the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, long suffering. Long suffering is a good word, Okay. Uh, it is it's in the Bible when you if you translate 
the Bible says that God is long suffering. Proper translation never says God is patient because patience has to do with circumstances. Now, you and I have to be patient because we cannot always deal with our circumstances. You're sitting in traffic. You have to be patient. All right. The word long suffering is a great word. It's like German. Anybody here speak German? Okay. Well, German, German, they don't make new words. They just string them together. And so that's why they're like this long sometimes. And long suffering means suffering long. Ooh, ooh, ooh. You know, I have to confess, I, I suffer from I suffer from the lack of long suffering. And so do the people that I deal with sometimes. All right. But it continuing gentleness, goodness, faith. Ah, here it is, the word meekness, temperance against such there is no law. There is no the word that is translated meekness here really does not translate the Greek word that we translate into meekness. Now, I have this book in my library by Binds Word Studies, and, and years ago I stumbled across when I was preparing for, preparing for a sermon and came across this idea. So he says the meaning of, and it's prautes, which uh, don't be impressed, it's real easy to to write down Greek and to learn its phonics and all that. But anyway, which is the word this translate is not really an ex expressed in English. But the terms meekness, mildness, commonly used suggest weakness and pusillanimity to a greater or less extent, whereas this word does nothing of the kind. Years ago, there was a cartoon character called Casper Milk Toast. And if you want to Google him, not now, now please, not now. Uh, later on, it is Milk, M-I-L-Q-U-E-T-O-A-S-T. Milk, milk Toast used to be a breakfast food that people would prepare. And he was he was a doormat. Uh, you know what a doormat is. You, you come in and you, you wipe your feet on the doormat. Well, the people would wipe their feet on Casper Milk Toast. Well, that's not the, the, the eye. And he was supposed to be the picture, the very embodiment of meekness. But that's not what God is talking about here when he says meekness. Now, it says here the fruit of the Spirit. What does that mean? That means if the Spirit of God is allowed to have his way, in my life and in yours, that we will produce these things. Now, how does one have the filling of the Holy Spirit? First of all, he must confess his sin, and I think he must be surrendered. Now, the, 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 here's, the, here's the thing, the indwelling of the Spirit. And by the way, I don't know what the word dwelling is in Hebrew, but the word dwelling in Greek is a strong, strong, very strong word. So we are indwelt by the Holy Spirit. What? Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and you're not your own, for you're bought with the price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit. And that's strong. That's permanent. That doesn't change. However, the filling of the Spirit is very, very fragile. The very instant that I take back control gone now with the filling of the holy spirit comes power power to live and obey live the righteously and to obey the the spirit of god as he prompts us and so when the spirit prompts us in a particular instance to be one of these things he provides the power but the moment we say no nah, i don't think i want to do that and we take that, we, we do what we want to do. The power to, is gone. The, the, the filling is gone. And we're back on our own. And what happens when you're on your own? Well, as Paul said, I know that in me, this is my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. In other words, the natural man will produce the works of the flesh. The, the, indwell, the, the person that is filled with the Holy Spirit will produce the fruit of the Spirit. And among these is meekness. Now, what in the world is meekness? Now, I read to you from Mr. Vines what it is not. <clears throat> and I, we could keep reading Mr. Vines. I think he had about this much in print. 
but I'm going to give you the condensed version uh, or the homespun one is this. What is meekness? And all the words in my definition are important. Meekness is the calm acceptance that whatever God does is the right thing to do. That what, It's the calm acceptance that whatever God has just done in your life is the thing that should be done. Now, there is a difference between uh, of opinion sometimes between what God does in my reaction to it, your reaction. God's, God's purview is, it is beyond this moment. It is beyond this week, this month, this year, this life. It encompasses all of eternity. His, his goals are not our goals in every sense. And that, it would be best if our, that we accept his goals. And when we accept his dealings, calmly accept his dealings with us, that is meekness. When I calmly agree with God that whatever he has just done. Now, what if he does something? Now, obviously, we don't have a problem with this until <laughs> you know when, right? When he does something we don't like. When he does something that is not according to what we would like to see done. When he damages something we own. When he takes something away. When he gives us a disappointment. When he brings us sickness, when he does something that is difficult, then there is the temptation to be upset with what he is doing. But meekness, now folks, meekness is a quality. It's not an event. It's not something that happens in a moment of time. It's exercised in a moment, but it is what we become. Now, Paul said, and we, we quoted the verse already twice, in my flesh dwelleth nothing that is good. And therefore the flesh can only produce that which is unpleasing to God, displeasing to God, and difficult in our interactions with others, and mind us, difficult to, for our, our, our own selves. When, when we are not living, and we, when, when we respond in the wrong way, what happens? Well, then the, 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 the calmness of spirit, that, that peace, that joy, that contentment is displaced by something that is malevolent and difficult. So, he's, so this meekness is something that is to... We are allowed to allow the Holy Spirit. Now, now, I'm not saying, let me back up and kind of retract a little bit. I don't mean that we might not struggle for a minute or two. All right. But we, but, but what, but when we want to have to exhibit that meekness and we're not in rebellion against what God has done, I do believe God gives us a little bit of wiggle room to adjust because he knows that my <clears throat> spirit, the spirit of humanity, the spirit of the fallen man is not, is, is not totally in, it's not in alignment, naturally in alignment with what God wants to do. So let's look at a few instances here where this word is used. Now I, I only use the ones that were translated meek. Uh, gentle is another one. That is sometimes used. Let's turn back to 1 Peter chapter 3. Now, ladies, this is addressed to the women. It, it, I don't believe that it's any less applicable in, in, in the male way that it should be uh, uh, exhibited. So he says here in uh, chapter 3 of 1 Peter and verse 4. He said, but let it be the hidden man. Now, the word man there is not male. It's the word anthropos, from which we get the word anthropology. So it's humanity. Let the, but, but, let, but let it be the hidden man or the, the hidden entity of the heart and that which is not corruptible, even the ornament 
of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. Now, the things that happen in our lives, some of them, yes, God brings them to us without a, a human uh, agency. But most of the time when we need to be meek, it's because of somebody else. You know, that wife, that husband, that neighbor, that guy on the uh, out there driving his vehicle like like he, you know, he like something that uh, ha is bereft of all reason and understanding and so on. And, and uh, we go on and on and on, even circumstances that that traffic, that line at Costco that's moving at the, at the, at the speed of a glacier and so on. <laughs> These, all these things that can get on our nerves. Some which are big. And some are like little grains of sand that rub us the wrong way. All of these things. Now, then what is the natural inclination is to react. So what we're talking about here is that meekness enables us to react in the proper way, in the biblical way, in the Christ-honoring way, in the way that some the other person in some cases may go, whoa, wait a minute, how can he do that? Because you see, we're empowered by God's Holy Spirit. When you want what God wants, for the same reason God wants it, then you are empowered to be different, to be different. Not simply, you see, we act according to what we are. You know, I, I'm obviously a male, okay? Men act in certain ways and women act in certain ways. Now, some things we, we share, but also there are things which are you know, my wife and I are always uh, kind of smiling, and maybe not always smiling, about, about how different men and women are. Their value system, what they think is important, how, how, how they, we both have filters. You know, a man has the male filter. The woman has the, what they, the men sometimes juristically call the fem filter. Okay, they, 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 we both got a set of ears. They're, they're, they're practically just alike. I, although I think most women, ladies' ears look a little better than men's ears. You know, by the way, your ears grow, grow all your life. My ears are so much bigger than they used to be. Okay, <laughs> but you, same ears, same, same hearing system, but then it goes through a brain that is very, very different. And so we, we react to what is difficult and the, the, a man has certain things he and woman different but you see we, we we it's we our reaction is according to what we are and so it is if we are meek then we will respond in a fashion that is pleasing now notice here he says and, you know, and, and if you read this passage down to, to, to verse four, uh, you, uh, a lot of nonsense is going on as it relates to women's women's dress. They're, they're, they say, oh, you shouldn't wear jewelry and you shouldn't do this. Well, wait a minute. I, I find it interesting. It says uh, they say, well, you shouldn't uh, wear gold and you shouldn't wear this and you shouldn't go wear that. Well, it also says you shouldn't put on apparel. And we know that's not right. Okay, so you got you have to you have to be careful how you you know you expose it. Now, what he's saying is don't don't make that the major thing. The thing that really matters is this meek and quiet spirit. And as they're talking here, and then he goes up in, in verse seven. He talks to the to the men. But what does it mean? When we are living our lives, those of you that are married, and I'm speaking to myself, okay, we need to be meek. What does that mean? That means that we need, and, and what is this, what, what is the outward growth? What is the outward 
manifestation of this meekness. Well, it would also, I think, it very aptly uh, find itself in other some of the other fruits of the Spirit, that we act in a loving way. We exhibit joy. In fact, uh, we're going to look at a little bit later uh, at a verse that tells us that we are to give thanks in difficult times, in difficult situations. Uh, that we're long-suffering, that we're gentle, that we're good, that we are temperate or self-controlled. Why? Because, well, me, I, I, I think, I, I know we like to put all these different fruits of the Spirit, and we, we say it's this and this and this, but it melds together. One affects the other. It's a whole lot easier to be long-suffering if you're meek <clears throat> because when something happens that you are that is a little bit difficult, you recognize that God has given it to you, and that whatever God gives to us is good. Now that doesn't nowhere in this Bible will you find that God has promised us a life of ease and 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 continual present uh, pleasantness. It's not here. In fact, there are numerous places where the Bible tells us that we, we will be tried, we will be chastened, we will suffer persecution. We will have, uh, Job says, in Job 5, uh, 5, 7, I think it is, yet, yet man is born into trouble as the sparks fly upward. In this world that we live in, it is should be expected that there will be difficulties, that we will have heartache and trouble and sickness and loss and so on. And so, knowing that, you and I have a have something. We have a filter that is really wonderful, and that is this: that God is good, Amen. and that uh, and, and it, that 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 goodness is exercise is empowered by omnipotence. That there's nothing that can come into our lives and lives unless God says. Yes, I'm reading through in my the, uh, Bible, daily Bible reading. I'm reading through the book of Job. We weren't all familiar with the fact that uh, Satan comes to God and they're talking about what, what's going on. And God says to him, have you considered my servant Job? And so the, Satan poo-poo's the idea that, that, that uh, Job is a good man. He, ah, he's good because you treat, treat him so well. And so God says, all right, you can, but don't touch his body. Then later, uh, Satan comes back. He says, well, yeah, skin for skin. You know, if you let me get a hold of it. And God said, all right, but you can't take his life. You see, God limits. The Bible tells us that, that we're every man is tempted when he's, um, so, excuse me, tells us that we're not tempted with anything uh, that's not normal, that's not that's uncommon. But God will, with the temptation, also wake, make a way to escape that we may be able to bear. It. Well, he'll not allow us to be tempted. Above what we're able. He will not allow us to be tempted to sin. He will not allow us to be tried beyond our capabilities when we are allied with God. Now, take God out of that equation and, and uh, we, we, we are all subject to temptations beyond our capability. But if we add that and the fact that God chooses no Satan, no further, no further. No, you can't do that. All right. But also, when God sends difficulties in our, in our lives, and, and let me make this little caution here. We, we are prone to what we like to, to go to Romans 8, 28, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are ca called according to his purpose. Now, use that in your own life freely. Be careful when you use it with others. But what, what does that mean? Does that mean that everything that God sends into our lives is good? No. It means that God will work it to make good. If, if you had something in your past that was horrendous, if you will allow him to, God will make something good out of it. You say, how? I don't know. That's not, not it within my powers. There are things that happen to us that are inexplicable. How could that be good? Well, God will somehow 
some way in his good time and in his perfect way, he will make it as good. Now, mind you, also, uh, you, you could take a, an isolated instance, but God doesn't deal necessarily that way. He may take that and that and that work together, work together, not work all by itself, but work together for good. And what is good? Good is not necessarily pleasant. Good is not necessarily easy. Good is not even necessarily for this life. Good transcends time. The eternity that God has for us. And, and, and by the way, folks, there are many things that we don't know. God knows, but we don't. Sometimes that good is in preparation for what is yet to come in this very present life. God is preparing us for something that will be. But because we cannot see beyond huh, right now. You know, you've you planned your day. But you don't know. that some, Someone could, could be all prepared to, to go do something and they're stricken with sickness or an accident or death or whatever. And it's good to plan. Now, let me back back up here in our planning we should hold these plans loosely my life is not mine it's not yours sometimes god says well, i know you want to do this but we're going to do this instead and everything in our lives we should hold with the understanding that god could change them take them away or whatever and by the way, folks, meekness includes our stuff. Now, we like stuff, don't we? You know, we drive, my, my wife and I drive down the highway and we see these uh, storage places. Now, I recognize in Brooklyn you don't have much storage. I, I've got a basement that I, 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 I'm working on now, folks. I, I, I think I, I, I've calculated, I believe that I can get my basement exactly where I want in about 500 hours of work. Okay. <laughs> No, that's no exaggeration, folks. That's really what I've calculated. Now, maybe I'll get it in 350. I don't know. But it's a big job. And it's stuff. All right? Uh, and and we, I, we have a lot. I have a lot of stuff, uh, partially because they give away the best things in, in Park Slope, okay? You know, you, you just pick up anything. I, I, could go, I could talk for, you know, if I sat down and made a list, I could just go on and on and all the things that people put out. They didn't want it. And it's turned out to be kind of handy for us but stuff is not yours it's his and since it belongs to him if he wants to mess it up what are you going to say well i don't i don't like that well, you're not being meek folks you're not being meek so a meek and a quiet spirit now you say pastor i thought you said that that does that doesn't translate this word yes but you see the meekness manifests itself in calmness, in calmness. I don't get upset. Why? Because God is dealing with me. God is doing, God allowed that to happen. God directed that to happen. Now let's look at Titus chapter three, Titus chapter three. We'll, we'll just, what time am I supposed to quit brother? I wouldn't say that. That could be dangerous. Because <laughs> I got a lot here. <laughs> Titus chapter 3. As soon as I find it, we'll read it. All right. Verse 2, he says, To speak evil of no man, to be no brawlers, but gentle Showing all meekness unto all men. As we live our lives and life happens to us, those things which are difficult, we are continually acknowledging. Now, there's a principle. It's the principle of practice. Now, practice can do a number of things. They used to say, uh, uh, 
when I was taking piano, practice makes perfect. No, practice does not make perfect in piano. Practice makes permanent. Okay. If you're doing it wrong, the harder you practice, the, the harder it's going to be to get it right. All right. But practice, but practice does many times give us improvement. If we keep practicing on something, then we get better at doing it. And you know what, folks? If you want, if you, if you want any kind of, of, of improvement in your character, God will give you the opportunities. Ooh, yeah, that's right. Uh, if, if God determines you need meekness and maybe you agree with, agree with him, you know what you're going to get? You're going to get some opportunities to practice that meekness or to practice that way of thinking, which will enable you to have that calm reaction to things. Now, why, why we, we must understand that God's dealings are good. That God is not out, he's not there to make our lives miserable, although that sometimes happens. But God is there to create improvement. God is there to, to cleanse me, to purge me, to make me more like the Lord Jesus. And so there are things that he sends or allows to come into our lives. And we must always recognize that there are no accidents in the life of a believer. There are things that appear to be so, and they would might be called that in the life of an unsaved person, but they are not accidents. God is used, God has the intention of using them. Now, mind you, folks, God's purpose is not always fulfilled. Now you say, well, I thought, I thought you, you believed in a sovereign God. I do. But you see, when God sends me a trial, I can waste it. I can waste it. I can squander it on anger and bitterness and resentment and a whole host of other negative responses. Or I can accept it as being from him. Now, folks, uh, I strongly recommend that you seek to be a fast learner. It's a whole lot easier on you, okay? I used to have a, a friend, God bless him, he loved his cars. He just loved his cars. I don't think he ever slept with the car, but I think he did sleep in it a few times. But he loved his cars, and God was always beating the daylights out of him, a scratch here, a dent there, uh, something, and and and. and, and and he, he, I don't think he ever caught on. I don't think he ever caught on. You, you see, God will give you opportunities to test your meekness. But you first have to think. Meekness is the calm acceptance that God is in, in control of all the things that happen in your life. And that he is doing them for good. For good. And good is according to the thinking of God. Let's look back at Colossians chapter 3. A couple of minutes. Colossians 3 in verse 12 he says, Put on therefore as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, Forbearing one another and forgiving one another. <clears throat> so here God gives a list of qualities. And he says to put them on. He got up this morning. And unless you're really strange, what you wore to bed last night is not suitable for church. Okay. Now, maybe some people dress like that. They just put their church. Uh, you know, if I'd have worn this, I'd have looked pretty, pretty awful right up this morning. So what do you did? You took those clothes off and you put on some others. So this is the, the idea in verse 12. Put on, therefore, put these things, these qualities on. And one of them is meekness. It's a deliberate, intentional purposeful 
act and determination to be meek. To allow our your to make it, you see, we, we, we react according to our thinking. If you think something is mine, then if something happens to it, then you, you get upset. If you acknowledge that that is God's and that you are only, uh, it's on loan to you and it, you are to be using it for his glory, then it's not mine. It's not yours. And therefore, you know what? If you mess up something that's yours, you know what? I don't grieve. I don't grieve. Why? It's not mine. It's yours. Now, I may not think you're using it wisely, but if, if your car has an accident, it's not the same as if my car has an accident. But it shouldn't matter because my car is not my car. It's God's car. All right? My life is not my life. It's his life. And the, 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 it, is, it, is, it should be the, the purpose of every believer to live in such a way that as we respond, our reactions are Christ-like. Remember, Jesus is called meek. He was called meek. Now, that doesn't mean that he was meek, weak. It meant that he was acknowledging constantly, always acknowledged that he it was the will of God that he should live the life that he should live, that he should go to the cross, that he should be persecuted, that all of these things should occur to him. That that and so he he accepted them with calmness. Let's turn to First Timothy chapter six. There's no order in this, in case you're. You're thinking there might be. In First Timothy chapter six, or that Second Timothy chapter six. No, there is no Second Timothy chapter six. Well, okay. Well, anyway. Verse eleven. Oh, that is. That's two ones there. Sorry. <laughs> But thou, O man of God, flee these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. The word follow after, the, the expression follow after has the idea that th this is something that we, we really want. We want this. We want to be meek. We want to be meek. For a number of reasons. We want to be meek because when we're not, it's like a, we make a mess of things. When we're not meek, we're not like the Lord Jesus and so on. Yeah, here's the verse I was looking for. Wrong books. Galatians 6.1. In Galatians chapter 6, verse 1, Paul is talking about a brother overtaken in a fault. Now, in a good church, we have to deal with people like that sometimes. Brethren, if a man be take, overtaken in the fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. A meek person has a, a certain kind of understanding of kindness and gentleness. These are not meek. These are the outward manifestation of the meek. Meek is what we is the definition that I gave you. But a meek person recognizes a number of things. First of all, he recognizes that this person, that they could have been where that person is except for the grace of God. That they could have been where that person is, except for the grace of God. The meek person recognizes his fallen proclivities. And we, we alluded to, to, to both of those in, in the past few minutes. That our flesh contains nothing good. That uh, we 
we are we could be we are not tempted above that which uh, no, verse 12 excuse me i didn't first corinthians 12 uh, 10 12 says wherefore let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall let me ask you i don't I don't you, you don't need to answer but just in your mind have you ever thought oh man it's been a long time since i did that some sin bam <laughs> just did it very shortly thereafter uh, in fact I, I, I whenever I think that I say Lord Lord please please Lord don't let me think that way let my confidence be in you let me rejoice that it's been a while but let not let me don't let don't let me let me take heed let me take heed and so this person, when, when when a person is overtaken in a fault, the spiritual deal with that person in a spirit of meekness. One, one last one and then we'll stop, okay? No, maybe two. <laughs> For, uh, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 2. 2 Corinthians, Paul is talking about dealing with a person who's been overtaken uh, in some kind of error, doctrinal error. Let's start verse 23. But foolish and unlearned questions avoid knowing that they do gender strive. And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves that God peradventure, peradventure means perhaps, will give them repentance to the acknowledgement of the truth and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at this at, at his will. Here you have a call for meekness in dealing with someone else, very similar to Galatians chapter 6 in meekness. And then finally, 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3. Quite a familiar verse, I think. But verse 15, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Folks, we do not do the cause of Christ any good with ridicule, with arrogance with looking down on a person in error. Now, there is a time, but we initially need to deal with those in doctrinal error with meekness, gentleness, kindness. We could be there. Had we grown up where they grew up, had our religious background been the same as theirs, we could be exactly where they are. We acknowledge that God has been gracious to us. And therefore, as a, as a result of that, as we sh give them the reason of the hope that is in us with meekness and fear, that we do so knowing that God has graciously given to us knowledge that he would like for us now to, in the right frame of mind in the right way in part to that person. So as you see, the application of meekness is rather broad. You'll get lots of opportunities to practice. Um, I'm going to go work on it myself a little bit. Uh, yeah. You know, as, as, they used, as they used to say, when you point your finger, there are three fingers pointing back at you. Uh, the Bible speaks of of, of trying to deal with the uh, uh, the moat in the other person's eye when you have a beam in your own. Uh, Jesus said in, in his exemplary prayer uh, that we are to pray, uh, thy will be done in, on, in, on earth as it is in heaven. The only person I can make do the will of God is myself. And uh, let us apply this to our own lives and as we do, we will have a calmness of our own spirit 
that is a blessing to ourselves, but it also will be a blessing to others. An example of the believer, as, as Paul said to Timothy, in word and conversation and charity and spirit and faith and purity. And we will be um, used of the Lord to be a blessing to all that we interact with.